how are you all today? I'm Amy Kennedy. I'm here representing the Kennedy Forum. And we're really pleased to be partners with Brain Futures. Um, through Kennedy Forum, we have white papers on brain fitness and on technology. And to see the work that you all are doing to uh, put into action some of the recommendations that we've come upon through Kennedy Forum is really impressive. It's exciting for me. My background is as a public school educator. I taught middle school for 15 years, and in that time, I began to see uh, a growing need for mental health in schools. It was not until I started to work more closely with my husband, Patrick Kennedy, who is involved in mental health and mental health parity that I could really put my finger on what was happening in schools, that I had felt um, my own teaching was lacking and was not addressing. Uh, so my first years in teaching, I did my best to plan lessons that I thought would get the message across to students, that would teach them about history, that would teach them life skills, and yet I still felt ineffective. It wasn't until I considered the role of mental health in classrooms and how um, I wasn't really working on students at where they were with their own brain fitness, with their own um, mental health, that made me realize we could do better. We could take this to another level if I moved past just teaching them about the Civil War or specific events, but, you know, approaching the child as a whole. So, it became a passion of not just mine, but of all of Kennedy Forum. So I'm excited to be here today um, to hear about the work of Jody and Bruce, and we also have Marty and Keisha, and they're gonna give just a quick introduction, if you would, about um, your background and why you're here today. Do you wanna start, maybe? Bruce. Well, I'm Bruce Wexler. I'm a professor at Yale and chief scientist and founder of a company, C8 Sciences. I'm giving you my disclosure right now, so I won't have to say it again when I do my slides. Um, and I've been working on developing, harnessing neuroplasticity to improve cognitive function for about 20 years. And about six years ago, we started applying it to the developing brain in young children, which is highly plastic and developed a program that can be used in schools to increase the ability to learn itself. And through that process, I've had the good fortune of collaborating with Keisha Johnson, that, who can say something about herself now. Good afternoon. I'm Keisha Johnson, and I'm a district-level educator for Duval County Public Schools in Jacksonville, Florida. And I am excited about being here, but um, one of the things that we're looking at right now is we're looking at how we can implement programs in low-performing schools. I work for a region called our, a transformation region or a turnaround region, which are our lowest performing schools in our entire district, which is about 50 schools. So I work with each one of these schools in order to make sure that they are improving student achievement data. I've been an educator for over 10 years and I've moved from the classroom into other roles outside of the classroom in school schools and to the district office and my passion is to make sure that all students have the opportunity to move forward and have co college and career success. I'm Martha Burns and I am the uh, director of neuroscience education for scientific learning corporation that makes the fast forward program um, and reading assistant. We're going to be talking about the neuroscience behind that briefly and then its implementation in uh, a school district in Starkville uh, and Jody Woodrum will be talking about that. I'm Jody Woodrum. I'm recently retired assistant superintendent for Starkville Octavaha Consolidated School District in Mississippi and have been fortunate enough to use the fast forward program um, created by the Scientific Learning Company for the last 10 years in Mississippi and in Georgia. Um, I have a 35 year background in education, most of that, um, the first part in the classroom and then the, the last part as a school principal or as a district administrator. All right, thank you so much. We're going to start with Jody and Martha to come up and give us a little bit more information about what they're doing in Mississippi. Thank you. Great. So it's delightful to be here. Um, and we're going to be talking about the Fast Forward program 
uh, in Mississippi. Uh, just as an overview of Scientific Learning Corporation, if you're not familiar with it, the corporation that has developed the Fast Forward program, uh, it's been uh, it's been available for 20 years. It was developed by Michael Mersnick, and you might have heard him speak earlier today. He also has developed as the founder of Brain HQ, um, and he is the one that Norman Deutsch talked about should be getting a Nobel Prize, and we kind of feel that way too for all of his work in neuroscience. So out of the world of neuroscience, about 20 years preceding Fast Forward, all of the research that Mike Mersnick did on neuroplasticity led to the development of the Fast Forward program, um, which is a technological program that has now served over two and a half million students in 55 countries around the world. Um, the reason that it's important, I think, and in getting to be even more important in our schools around the country right now is because of the increase in poverty. Uh, I do a lot of presentations. On, I'm actually going to Atlanta Children's Hospital tomorrow to speak on um, the effects of poverty on the brain, but also the effects of hospitalization and anesthesia. But we're starting to understand how many influences affect brain development and affected in a way that is reversible. Uh, and that's the nice thing about a neuroplasticity design program like Fast Forward is it is designed to reverse those negative effects of poverty, the negative effects of stress, the negative effects of other influences on brain maturation. Um, and I'm sure you're all aware of the increase in poverty and Jody Woodrum will be talking about uh, the Starkville district, as she said, uh, which was a high po is a high poverty district. Um, but right now, education performance has been stagnant in many areas, and largely that is because of factors like this, in, the increase in, in poverty. 44% um, of students from poverty are below basic in most of their educational uh, areas. Neuroscience, I don't have to tell you about. <laughs> You've been hearing about it for two days from the, the most renowned experts in the world. Um, so you've had a head start on that uh, coming into it, but I will just share with you the fMRI data of Fast Forward. We also have a lot of data from school districts that we'll, be sh that we'll share with you, especially Mississippi. Um, but, but I do want to just go through with you the neuroscience research that uh, that was used, the fMRI research first by Elise Temple, and then uh, it was replicated again. Elise Temple was in John Gabrielli's lab um, when this was done originally at Stanford, and then the second study, the Nadine Gabb study, um, was done um, on the East Coast uh, and replicated the result. But essentially what you're looking at in the slides are typically reading children. You're looking at fMRI scans of the left hemisphere and the regions of the brain that are active when they're doing a phonological awareness task. This was 35 children, the left picture, 35 children, so it's a brain average. That's why we don't see any convolutions in the brain. Um, but 35 children who were second grade who were le reading at grade level. In the middle picture, what you see in the middle slide is 35 reading impaired children. Um, they had been diagnosed as dyslexic, but as you probably know, often that diagnosis is a discrepancy diagnosis. It wasn't based on neurological necessarily findings of any kind, but rather that they were two standard deviations below the mean for reading in the second grade. And then what you see um, is after six weeks of very intensive training with the Fast Forward program, this first study was published in 2002, after very intensive training with the Fast Forward program, what you see is the brain is essentially normalized. So you see that those areas of the brain, the inferior frontal gyrus, which is the red circle, and the um, actually a temporal parietal junction, which is the blue circle, are lighting up after the six weeks of the intensive fast-forward intervention. In addition, you see the visual word form area light up for the first time in these students, and that's a hallmark of early reading uh, activity that Stanislaus de Hen and others have identified as crucial to good reading. And um, 
you also see uh, the left medial temporal gyrus. The fast forward program does a lot of intensive training of speech sound perception, as Michael Mersnick talked about this morning, auditory processing, but rapid auditory processing. So you're building up auditory processing speed. And so that act area is activated as well. Um, so it is through that mechanism of driving the brain to really essentially normalize itself that in a very short period of time, six weeks, you were able, you're able to see students uh, read and learn to read effectively. Now they'll still need to be taught to read, they still need the educational process, but what it does is it levels the playing field. Those students are then able to respond to reading interventions and respond to to classroom teaching, which Jody will talk about. And I just also want to emphasize, right before I'm done, that those are the some of the major areas that several researchers have found are affected by poverty as well. So we, although we don't have specific fMRI evidence on brains of children of poverty, we know from this research that those areas are activated and are normalized. So with that, I'll turn it over to Jody. Woodrum. Thank you, Marty. It's my pleasure to be here today and represent Starkville, Mississippi. And basically what I have for you is a story. It's a school district that is a university town. But whenever you say Mississippi, um, there's an elephant in the room because of these statistics. So I just want to address them up front. The poverty rankings, the educational rankings, the um, life expectancy rankings, um, gross domestic product, pretty abysmal in a lot of areas. And so from my perspective, programs like this, like what Fast Forward brings to the table and to our children, spells hope for the future. So Starkville, it's home of the Yellow Jackets and the Bulldogs of Mississippi State University. So we're Mississippi State University town but what that does is it creates this disparity in the classroom in our public schools. We have the highest 25% of students um, who they can compare to kids anywhere, go to any um, advanced university. And then we have 25% of our children sitting in the same classroom side by side who come from just abject poverty. 70% free and reduced lunch. And you can see our demographics at the bottom. Um, small Hispanic population, small Asian population, 27% Caucasian, 68% um, African American, a little over 5,100 students. We're known for a lot of things, um, some good things in that area, lots of sports, lots of baseball. Um, also, Dak Prescott will take, um, will take um, that wonderful um, honor of saying that he was the quarterback at MSU before he we went to uh, Dallas. We're all big Dallas fans now. Um, but we're also known for some other things. In the end of 2014-15, we were named a fast forward or scientific learning um, national reference site, one of about 20 in the country, for our success with using this particular program and using it with fidelity, which it's not software that you would use and set kids over on, in the corner on it and put it on autopilot. It is a, a marriage of well-trained staff but it can be paraprofessionals as well as teachers, using it with children and back and forth, looking at results and intervening when necessary to help them move to the next level. So that was pretty, pretty important for our school district. But part of what allowed us to get to that point and be recognized by the company were the things like what happened in June 2015, um, it's at the bottom of the slide here, that following use of the program in third grade that year, 55 third graders who came into a particular school were pre-tested as beginning readers. They were in third, just entered third grade, pre-tested as beginning readers, 55 of them. The principal was absolutely in a panic. What are we gonna do with these children? Because our state had just instituted a fourth grade, I mean, a, in a third grade, sorry, reading gate test that the kids were going to have to pass at the end of the year to go to fourth grade. And these kids were projected to be nowhere close. Well, after intensive use of fast forward for that school year, and many of them did not even get it for the whole year, they all passed. 
They all pass, every one of them passed that reading test for the state. It was absolutely amazing. Then we had another landmark situation that happened. Starkville City Schools was by state decree merged with the surrounding Octibaha County to become Starkville Octibaha Consolidated School District. And if you want to scan your little, what is that a QRL or something up there? There have been some articles written about that merger because it was the first time that a failing school district, Octibaha County, was merged with a, what had been considered a successful school district in the city of Starkville. So there's a Heckinger report that's been written about it and some things that were done. But the challenges that it brought immediately to us and in that first year, trying to make sure that all of the students who had been in Octibaha County, who had very little internet access at that time, suddenly had access to software programs that they had never had before. The company, Scientific Learning, stepped in and worked very closely with our district at our request to make sure that we could finance the use of this program in, in the additional schools that we were taking on. So West Elementary, I want to highlight for you, was one of those Octibaha County schools. It's a small school. Um, but since that point of consolidation, and in the, even in the last few months, the kindergarten reading growth was noted as top 10 in the state of Mississippi. Those kindergartners use fast forward. The, the, this particular school made the highest reading gains, 1.3 grade equivalent, on reading progress indicator, which is the built-in pre and post assessment in the program of any school in our district. And they have since I did the slide been named an A school in the state of Mississippi. So it's pretty phenomenal stuff. We also use the program, so those were kindergartners, we use the program all the way up to about 10th grade in high school. Every student in the district that has this great reading need, if we can, they get to use this program. The problem is we don't have enough computers and staff to man it for as long as we would like to for each child. We would like for them to have um, finished two programs a year. Right now they're getting a little over one. But one of our great successes is that our state is looking at the growth of our kids. And that is something that we did very well on in the first year of the new state assessment. The growth of the lowest 25th percentile students in math and in reading was our highest level, was the, the peak um, data that we had that we could walk away from and say, yes, this is working. This is working. Our graduation rate, since we've started those 10th graders, 9th and 10th graders on the program, in the last four years we've had a steady rise. We're now at 81%, which in our state, that's, that's pretty good. So mid-year last year, the end of first semester, we have a team of people that look very closely at our data and work with the things that, that need to be done to help us um, progress because it's a lot of looking at reports, a lot of um, figuring out which kids do we need to tweak this with and which ones are doing fine. Of the 650 students in the first semester last year that took a pre and a post test on the program, those who started out in the struggling proficiency level decreased by 46% by the time they got to the end of that semester. The students who were proficient or above increased by 89%. It's working. It's working for us. At the end of last year, what we saw on average was a one year, one month, grade equivalent gain. Well, that doesn't sound like much in a year. Ah, but it only took 59 school days to get it. 59 days, that's less than a semester. So if we can repeat that in second semester, the hope is there. The hope is definitely there. 28% of those students made a year and a half gain or more in that 59 days of school. 57% of the struggling students transitioned to a higher proficiency level after just those 59 days. These, these numbers are phenomenal for where we were and where we want to go. And the hope that it represents is, is, is amazing. So we have individual school breakdowns. 26% of all the students in the district are now participating in this program. We would do them all if we could because there's even a place for helping kids who are advanced already to help them advance further. But we have to pick and choose because of time and resources. So we tend to focus the program more on our kids who struggle. 
but all of this represents children. So this was an email that I sent to the middle school principal to let him know about some of the phenomenal results that we were seeing with his seventh graders last school year. And so these are kids. 15% of them made more than 20 points growth on an NWEA MAP test, Measures of Academic Progress, which is a growth measure, it's totally separate from the scientific learning program. More than 20 points growth at the seventh grade level when five points or six points is the national average of growth? Yes. Ten, per, ten students, Mr. Timothy Bourne, you can now count on, we can probably take them out of this program and put them back on a regular reading program, regular in the classroom. They don't need this anymore. The others are going to take a little longer. And I'm the one that gets to make some of those parent phone calls. Those were fun phone calls to make. Called a parent, a, a woman who worked at Mississippi State University, and said to her, I want to tell you about your child and how we're getting ready to take him out of this program. He's in seventh grade, and we're going to get to put him back in a regular classroom for reading. And she stopped me. She said, are you talking about my child? I said, yes. And I went over his name, and you're his mom. Right? Yes, yes. My child. Can I put you on hold? I want to get my husband, who's in the office, down the hall. I want to get him on the phone. Will you tell him? It was like they didn't believe me that this kid had made this kind of progress this fast. Attendance goes up. Discipline goes down. Kids are able to focus and pay attention more in the classroom. And what I tell teachers all the time is this is not something that replaces you. What this does, if we do it well, is it allows kids to leave that lab at 10 o'clock today and come back to your classroom and be with you and be more attentive and get more out of the regular instruction that you're providing to them. This provides the hope and the foundation. I don't know how I'm doing on time. Um, but I want to share this one last thing, is that something that we're getting ready to be known for, we hope, is that we're very proud to have what appears to be, from all of our research across the country, the only public middle school in the country who will serve every sixth and seventh grader, every, that's the distinction, every sixth and seventh grader in that school district on a university campus. The school, um, the ground has been broken, it should open in, in 2018. It's a partnership middle school. It sits up on the hill above Mississippi State University near the baseball field and looks down across the campus. Now, doesn't that kind of take college and career ready to a whole nother level? Those kids will have access to the 13 museums that are on that Mississippi State University. They can walk there. One of the seventh grade teachers says, wait, you mean I don't have to fill out a field trip form to put them on a yellow bus anymore? Nope, you can walk. But what I want to point out, down here at the bottom, you can't see it, but I can, in the yellow arrow, that is a fast forward lab, dedicated to fast forward, and there's one on each floor, one for the sixth graders and one for the seventh graders, because that's how important it has become. Thank you. I'm going to talk to you about uh, another set of data with another type of training program that's going to show you that we should have even more collective confidence in the ability of this sort of approach to have major impact. If there's a national problem that is urgent and that we all actually should be ashamed about, and that's the achievement gaps related to poverty in our country and then indirectly with race. You can see here that if you come from poverty situation, you are three times more likely than kids from a higher, higher socioeconomic status to be below deficient in your tests and correspondingly less likely to meet proficiency standards. By eighth grade, this is a pattern that's seen in every city across the country. The blue bars are the scores of the white children and the Hispanic and African American students are in the two other bars. By eighth grade, uh, the two minority groups related to poverty are two grade levels behind their cohort group. Why? What's the problem? What's the roadblock? Inattention, low self-control, and problems with memory. Decades of research have shown that these three cognitive skills, focused attention, self-control, and memory, are better predictors of school outcome than IQ. 
Other research has shown that children from poverty have compromises in exactly these cognitive skills, which we call executive functions. Brain imaging studies have shown that by nine months old, if you're a child from poverty, they can already see differences in the distribution of EEG activity related specifically to attention and language skills, nine months. When you're a little bit older, we can see the uh, effect of poverty on brain structure in terms of brain thickness and cortical surface area. Again, in areas that we know to be related to these same cognitive operations. So poverty decreases executive function in many ways, unfortunately, and these children come to school with multiple insults to their neurodevelopment, and then they're placed in a situation through no fault of their own that they're not neurocognitively prepared to meet the demands made of them, and this sets off a developmental trajectory of great cost to the child, the family, the school, and society. This is just some of our own assessment data in our particular program. We give formal research quality tests of focus, self-control, and memory. And what you can see, this, these are the scores from, these are the uh, scores from a, a district actually in Texas of si higher socioeconomic status. Tests of focus, self-control, and memory administered in the classroom automatically by the teachers and scored and sent back in reports. The way it's displayed here is that the gray color represents the kids between the 20th and 80th percentile. That's where your majority of kids are going to be. Green shows you kids in the top 20th percentile, and the pink color is the kids in the bottom 20th percentile. And that's pretty much what we see in these three measures in a so higher socioeconomic group. This is the data from Duval County. Look at this. These are supposed to be 20% of the kids in the, minus, in the lowest 20th percentile. They're supposed to be equal numbers of green and pink, but you don't see that. This is the compromise of executive function related to poverty. So we know that the ability to learn depends on executive function, focus, self-control, memory, a collection of skills that are necessary for managing the self and managing information. So it's a straightforward proposition. If we could improve those skills, we should be able to reverse some of this disadvantage conveyed on children because they grow up in poverty. So the program that we created, we call it the Activate Program. It's an integrated program of computer-presented games integrated with physical exercises. Physical exercise improves neuroplasticity. We've heard a lot about physical exercise already. We took it a step further and we designed physical exercises that have cognitive components so they actually are training focus, self-control, and memory in the context of whole body activity and social interaction. And we do it at the same time as they're getting the computer exercises to train those same functions. The computer games have their six different games. They each have hundreds of difficulty levels, and then they're uh, rapidly individualized for each child so that 30 children in a class essentially have 30 different training programs. We were... The, our our specific computer programs were independently evaluated by an anonymous expert reviewer for the director of the National Institute of Health who said our programs are easily the most sophisticated brain training programs ever conceived. So what about the data that it actually works? This is our proposition again. We have computer presented exercises, physical exercises designed to harness neuroplasticity, improve function of uh, executive function systems, uh, largely in the frontal lobes and parietal lobes of the brain, to produce attentive behavior in the classroom with good self-control, and this is real data, to produce uh, positive outcomes that transfer. So you may have heard about the issues with uh, brain training programs. Do they just get better at the program, or does it transfer? Well, we'll show transfer, what's called near transfer, to cognitive skills that are other than the ones that were trained, and we'll show far transfer to actual improvement in real-world function as measured by the schools themselves. So here's our first proposition. Do we show improved focus, self-control, and memory? So we have thousands of children that have used the program. One of the first questions is, if you want to give tests at the beginning before they use the program, and again, after they use the program, question is, what if you just took the test twice? You're going to get better? 
So we have uh, 100 children, 100 children, 75 children, took the test twice of focus, self-control, focus, self-control, and memory. And you can see that there's no improvement from simply taking the test twice. But if you do 800 minutes of training with our program, you have highly significant gains in all three of these core executive functions. We had a natural experiment presented to ourselves in a school district that used the program two years in a row. We do our assessments at the beginning of the school year. So at the beginning of first grade, we had children sitting in the classroom, some of whom had been in a kindergarten the year before that had our program, and some had not. But now they're sitting in the same room, side by side, same first grade, automatically getting these tests administered by computer at the same time. So we said, well, is there any benefit from the kids who had done our program in kindergarten? And here you see it. Highly significant improvements in focused attention and self-control that increase school readiness because these are, that's the transition from kindergarten to first grade. These are the cognitive skills you need when you get there. And the effects carried over from the summertime uh, to the next school year. So what about then transfer to school achievements? So these are data that were sent to us by schools. These are formal tests by the Pearson Company of, and I don't know how many of you know how this is, is presented, but green means an, a proportion of kids that are meeting proficiency. Yellow is the proportion that are just below, and red are the proportion that are way below and in big trouble. So this was a class that, uh, a third grade class, 95% of the kids free lunch. The one school, one class, a teacher's initiative used our program and then sent us the data. This is from the fall before they used our program, 83% proficiency after they used our program. And this is a district. The whole district had 60% proficient. The school that was 95% poverty had 83% proficient. Here's another one done by a teacher at her own or his own initiative. This is a first grade class, 49% free lunch. 92% of the kids met proficiency standards. They sent this to us never in the district in any school had they had 92%. So we were excited, but it's not a formal study. I was fortunate then to get a gift from the Roddenberry Foundation, Gene Roddenberry, uh, Star Trek, to do a formal study of over 500 second grade children. And we had pre-designated control classes, and we had the classes that got our program. Here you, show, you see the math assessment. 82% uh, of the kids were proficient. These were not poverty schools. They already had nearly 70% proficient in the whole district, but they had a significant gain, 82% uh, percent proficient after using our program. That translates into an effect size in this data of 0.41. If you look at effect size of one-on-one -on -one tutoring, 0.40. We had higher effect on math improvement and one-on-one -on -one tutoring, and we also improved reading at the same time, and it was given to a whole class at the same time. So this is the effect size comparison I just mentioned to you, and also some obvious cost comparisons. So now, with a couple of minutes to spare, I'm gonna turn it over to my colleague, Kalisha, uh, Keisha Johnson. So, Duval County Public Schools is the 20th largest school district in the nation, and it's also the sixth largest school district within the state of Florida. Well, our leadership team within our transformation region, which is the region that has the lowest performing schools in our entire district, um, is faced with the problem of removing the barriers that Dr. Wexler just mentioned that are causing for students to have low student achievement and to because of the because of poverty and many other factors. So we are looking to develop the whole child and actually to help students in order for them to move forward and be see a measure of success. So in our transformation region, we are the we have the lowest one third schools in the state. So we have to report everything to the state. We have people in and out of our buildings all the time and the students are discouraged, the teachers are discouraged, um, and we knew that we had to do something. So 60% of those um, schools in our district are low performing schools, and we have 174 schools within our district with 129,000 plus students. Last time we looked, it was 132, and we still have students constantly coming into our district. Well, we used the, um, the Activate C8 Sciences program, and we saw a tremendous level of success with that program. But before we saw that success, we had students that were 
at 93% of those students were below average. So in other words, you know, you see the red, you see the yellow, you see the green. All of our students were red. When you went into a school and you went and looked at their data wall, it was completely red. So the principal was very perplexed, everyone was, because of the fact that they were unable to um, have the differentiation that they needed in order to assist students to move forward. Um, so they, they, and the reason that they were unable to have that differentiation is because they had too many students that were on the bottom that were low performing. So we have the historically low performing schools in our region. We chose the K through two schools. So let me tell you why we chose K through two to use Activate. Um, because of the fact that we wanted to actually track these students over a period of time. Another reason is because of the fact that our VPK programs in Duval County are the ones that are really suffering. So we chose to use those schools in order to move forward and have the students to, in the third grade, see what their test scores would look like. Did some research in, in regards to executive function and thankful that our former superintendent, Dr. Nikolai Vitti, decided to use um, Activate C8 Sciences and had the board to approve use of that program for these K-2 schools in that initiative. So let's get to the reading student achievement scores. We use iReady data in order to measure reading student achievement and math student achievement. The reason that we're using that is because of the fact that the FSA is not taken until the third grade. So we were able to actually use iReady for both because in, in third grade and above, we use Achieve 3000. So let's look at the comparison from the winter to the spring. And I must tell you that we only, we started using the program in March and we ended in June, which is something that when I show you the, the outcomes or the data outcomes, you're gonna, it's gonna be amazing. So let's go ahead and look at this. Um, of course, we look at students that are on iReady um, before using the Activate program in the 15 and 16 school year. And then we look at students that are after Activate in, um, in the 16, 17 school year. But wanna move forward um, because this is the part of the data that I really want to be able to show you is that over 60% of the students that were using Activate C8 Sciences in comparison with the schools that were um, the K2 students in other schools within our region actually had tremendous growth. And when I say tremendous growth, I'm referring to 60% growth. In some schools, it was higher than that. It was at 65% growth. And this is very important because we looked at the fact that our K2 students when they go over to their sister's school in the third grade, they have to take the FSA. And we want for them to start out on a level that they're either approaching or they are proficient. So we don't want them to be non-proficient. So, and we had in these three schools that we used, and that was um, SP Livingston, John Love, and Hyde Grove Elementary, we had, in one school, 97% of the students were non-proficient. In the other school, 95% of the students were non-proficient. And in the other school, 93% of those students were non-proficient. And that's, that's big, because you don't expect to see um, that in one school. I mean, the number of students that are not proficient in one school. So I do relate to what um, they were saying in regards to Mississippi. You would think that our district would be moving forward a lot more because we are a large district, but however, we have um, a lot of poverty in our district. We're a rural urban school district, um, which is very unique. We have Baldwin, Florida in our district, which is a farming community, and we also have Jacksonville, Florida, which is one of the largest cities in the country. So let's go ahead and look at the math data for um, spring iReady and winter iReady in the comparison. So you'll see right here that the piloted schools actually had an increase in student achievement from winter to spring. Now, one of the things is, is that I want you to look at, um, these are the three schools, but when you look at the district proficiency that was post-Activate, and when I'm saying district proficiency, I'm referring to other turnaround schools because I'm not comparing it to schools that are high-performing students. 
But when you look at the difference in the data, you see that the after activate, the schools that did not get activate basically were at 21%, but then you have the other ones averaged at about, you know, 72% of growth. Um, this is big. And we are really at this point trying to implement this program in more schools in our, in our region because we feel like that the use of Activate Learning for the students is going to help the students to increase in, in their student achievement levels. I mean, the data does speak to that. So when you look at the math already, when you're looking at pre and post, and, and one of the things I must mention to you is historically students do well in math. Our reading district average is below 50%, so, um, and that's for proficiency. So, and in math, we're almost at 60%. But this year, we're expected to drop below that because we have a curve where after a certain period of time, students are... Um, students, we have to end up servicing or taking the students that are the lowest and actually putting them in the tested categories. So, and we're at that point right now. And that goes for um, K through 12. So right now, of the average for math, if you look at the district average, it's 32%. And this is from iReady, once again, with K2 students. But you see the other schools, one of them's even almost at 80% post-activate. And I really think that this is because of the fact that when the students are on the brain training program, it helps them to focus and helps them to be able to uh, focus enough so that they can go and, and listen in class and do the work that they need to do. And then also when they're testing, it helps them to be able to focus as well. So that was some. So we looked at the early warning indicators. Our students, just as I mentioned before, with the data wall being in red with the student achievement data, it's the same way when it comes down to early warning indicators. But we did find that after the students in these three schools used Activate C8 Sciences, we saw improvement in um, not having these barriers or these early warning indicators, which is chronic absences, behavior, retention, same thing that we, you all have all talked about over the past two days. Their projected level um, is measured by the state assessment, of course. So this is all measured by state assessments. However, we look at early warning indicators because we want, in K-2 students, because we want to see how they are going to actually do on the um, state assessment, but also how they're going to progress throughout their 12 years of high school, as, I mean, of school as well. High school. I used to teach high school. Okay, so early warning indicator reduction. So we actually had an average of a 6% reduction in students that had two or more early warning indicators with those K-2 schools, which I find um, amazing because these are, these, these are the barriers that the teachers are experiencing that they're not able to teach the students. So to have that reduction of 6%, even though it looks like it's a small amount, it's really a, it's really a big thing. And here's, the, uh, here's an example, and that was the average, but when you're looking at 12% a reduction in one school. And by the way, the school, this school right here, High Grove Elementary or High Grove Early Learning Center, had the most disciplinary problems in our entire region. So they had a 12% reduction in early warning indicators, which most of it was behavioral, and it's because of the communities that the students come from. Um, SP Livingston is the largest early learning center, um, but this, and then another thing I wanna mention is this school has a brand new principal. This school has a seasoned principal. So that's why you see the differences as well. Um, and then John Love Elementary is the smallest school out of the three. So, but to have that reduction is amazing. So the results, we actually had 925 students that participated in these three schools. The, out of the 925 students, they used the program. We wanted them to use the program 60 minutes a week. Um, Sometimes it was not 60 minutes. We actually used the program from March to June, which is our testing time, which a lot of times, because they are sister schools to a school that is a testing school, they had to 
give up their technology to that other school because of the fact that we don't have, we're not technology rich yet. Um, so in saying that, 60 minutes a week, with those, with those results, I find very amazing. 60% um, of those students completed the targeted usage, which is good. Um, one, of the, one of the things that I would look at is the fact that the teachers were motivated to use the program because they saw the results in the students. So, um, and because the teachers were motivated to use the program in their classrooms, because we all know, um, and from being a teacher, oh, here's another program, here's another thing that I have to do, and I still have to get my students to show some sort of growth because of the fact that even though iReady is not um, the state assessment, they still, that, that's a part of their VAM score, which is a part of if they're gonna get a raise or if they're not gonna get a raise. So basically, um, those teachers basically, for them using the program, that means that they actually bought into the program. Students that were using the program saw executive function improvement after 400 minutes of usage, which is very good. Um, I, we weren't expecting to see these results, not to say that we didn't think the program worked, but we've used so many programs in our region. I mean, it's almost like um, every year there was a new program. This year, we're trying to sustain this program instead of going and trying to use another one because of the results that we've seen. And of course, we have seen a level of success. We have a long way to go in Duval County, especially in the transformation region, but we want to see these schools transform and no longer have a transformation region. Thank you. Maybe you could tell us, we heard a little bit in this program about how much time they're using it and what grade levels, what the idea was behind the program you're using for targeting it to certain ages. We heard kind of it was uh, uh, several different grade levels. And how much time were you recommending that it be used to see it be effective? Um, okay, so the research that, that is behind Fast Forward was done by Michael Mersnick and others um, at UCSF and then Rutgers, showing that the intensity uh, that's recommended is five days a week, it, the, the original intensity was five days a week, and that's, those six weeks results were from 90 minutes of training a day. We now have data that shows that you can, for students who are not terribly behind English language learners, students who are, are um, struggling with reading but not classified as dyslexic, three days a week uh, at a minimum of 30 minutes a day is recommended. Um, and most schools try to aim for five days a week, 30 minutes a day, because of field trips, because of other things that can interfere with that, those other two days. Um, but we do get the same results, it's just that it takes a longer period of time. The intensity it level is based on the research Mike did originally with um, animal studies showing that you need this constant intense exercising of the brain to get these dramatic results quickly. So the, in, the protocol is a, an essential component of the, uh, the success of the program. Okay, and so with that, you, I'm sure there were challenges to bring that to scale in a school. Could you maybe talk a little bit about some of the challenges? Sure, and Jody, I'm sure can <laughs> talk about that too. So the original design of Fast Forward in, when it first came out in 1997, it was used mostly in clinics, clinics of psychologists, speech language pathologists, with language and reading impaired students, LD specialists. Um, and it was done often in summer. So the children would come for the six week training in a summer period. Uh, as we moved into the public schools, we realized that that was not a model that was going to be useful for public schools. It was too much time. Um, and that's where we began to collect the data on the shorter protocol. Um, many school districts do it before school. Um, some do it after school. Some do a pull out of the students, and Jody can address that a little bit. Um, in Starkville, it's mostly a pull out program. So the classroom teacher is still with the bulk of the class and the, the children that have been identified that need the program will go down the hall to a computer lab and work with a, a paraprofessional or a teacher there. And in our lower grade levels, beginning at kindergarten to about second 
grade, maybe third grade. Um, we do 30 minutes a day. We aim for five days a week, but our average is probably about four, four and a half. And then by the time we get into fourth grade to middle school and then into high school, um, it is a 40 minute protocol that we use five days a week. And then each individual child may average like again, four and a half days in there because of, as you said, field trips and things. Is that the yeah. answer? Yeah, congratulations on your new campus. That sounds exciting. And is there any way that you see your new position um, on that campus as as serving this program besides the space? Well, one of the things that's really strong with this partnership program is Mississippi State University is a teacher preparation university for the state of Mississippi. And so with the state contributing um, $5 million towards the building of the school, the idea is that, that this school can become a learning site for future teachers in Mississippi and, and surrounding schools as well. But mainly Mississippi, future teachers can come here, come into this middle school, and then learn some things to do and not to do. And one of the things that we really want them to be able to see is a program like this that's working and that's, that is successful for our students to see how it can work. And then wherever they go to be a teacher after that, they can say, wait a minute, I've seen this program. I've seen a program. We could try this. And so it's, it's the idea that we can spread the ideas. We can, we can learn. Um, with the partnership school, it was specifically chosen to be a sixth and seventh grade school so that if a person is coming to get a teaching degree at the elementary grades in Mississippi, mm -hmm. that is K-6. If it's a middle and high school, that certification goes from grades 7 to 12. And so that way, every future teacher that goes to Mississippi State University would be able to go into that school. That's great. Thank you. Bruce, maybe you could talk to us a little bit about, uh, I, especially coming right off of summer, you know, the fact that you're telling us how this transfers over and the results are lasting through a summer break that we all worry about kind of the lag and sliding backwards. Um, maybe you could tell us a little bit about that. Well, we are, we are hoping that the uh, benefits would last even longer than the summer, but we did have that uh, opportunity to look and demonstrate that they did continue over the summer. What we hope to do is create uh, the cognitive skills that will enable the children to change their relationship to the school process itself and be able to get much more out of everything else that's offered them. So our program is a multiplier. So remember, we used it for the whole classroom. This is not pull out because we're talking about children from poverty schools. Where, and what we're trying to address here is not a neurodevelopmental disorder, although our program is used for children in special education, but we're talking about a different proposition. The brain develops from stimulation from the environment. Children from poverty have not gotten the type of stimulation, the amount of proper stimulation to promote development of these systems. So I call our program a school lunch program for the brain. Because when kids don't get enough to eat, then they come to school and we give them a school lunch, uh, that nutrition enables their body to grow faster and catch up to their potential. These children are coming to school, and that's nothing wrong with their brains except for the fact that they didn't get the stimulation that they need. So we are providing that intensive focused stimulation directly to the neural systems that are essential for success in school. And I think that's the reason that we're able to see such big effects. Oh, I love that analogy about the l school lunch. Uh, Keisha, you talked about teacher buy-in, which I think um, as a former teacher, uh, we all get that, you know, getting the teachers to buy in. But how also do you get the administration and the parents to buy into this program that is universal, that is for everyone, and say, yeah, we're not going to just do this with kids who are showing that they're lagging? Um, being visible as a district level leader and um, actually encouraging, motivating the school leadership to buy into the program. Um, one of the things that I look at is a top down. If you're excited about the program, you show that you're excited about the program, they see you in the trenches with them, which I go to the schools and work with them, then they're gonna buy into the program. If the students see you there, then they're gonna, sit, they're gonna use the program. So 
it's very important to be hands-on. Um, my old supervisor, Ironetta Wright, which is now the deputy superintendent in Detroit, Michigan, said what gets monitored gets done. Well, it's about monitoring, but monitoring in an effective way where you're actually working hand-in-hand -hand with the schools, with the school leadership, with the teachers, even with the students, the parents, to let them know that we're all in this together and we're going to get through this and we're going to see that level of success because we're all in it together. Were, were Paris able to implement this at your school or was it just the Actually, teacher? we even had some, some volunteers, um, some student teachers, but we also had other volunteers that came into the school. We use all hands on deck. And we do that in turnaround schools. Um, we even, uh, to be honest with you, in some situations, not in Activate, but in other situations, our, our custodial staff all the way to our <laughs> leadership team is all in whatever we're doing in that school because we need everybody. We need everybody. Yeah. I want to take a couple questions from the audience because I know we don't have a whole lot. Do you want to start up front? Sure. sure. As impressive as, as these results are, and they certainly are, I congratulate you, um, it's hard not to think about the variables. Um, I mean, how could, and I'm a school district leader too, how could we not think about things like quality of teaching and level of engagement in a regular classroom as opposed to when they go into these computer rooms to do, and are, is what we're saying that these computers are working better than the teachers are working? I, because in a sense, if you just look at the results, the, a case could be made for that. Well, I mean, first of all, in Duval, these were done in the classroom. And, and oh, by the teachers, the classroom teachers are the ones, the, they're the ones that administer it along, and they do it three times a week for 20 minutes. So it's in the context of they're doing many other of their teacher things. This is not the biggest part of what they're doing. So, but why does it, could it work? And it's because it is so focused. That's what we've been talking about here for the therapeutics too of brain-based. If you really know where the weak point is, the weak link in the chain, and you have something that can address that, that can be a big multiplier. Yeah. Yeah, so that's why I showed you those diagrams. I mean, it's already established that these three cognitive skills are essential for learning. It's already established that the uh, poverty compromises the skills, and I showed you the slides, compromises the brain development starting at nine months that's essential for these skills. We know about neuroplasticity. So if we can go in and intensively stimulate and activate those exact systems that need more development, that's the rationale. Now, I am pleased and surprised that it worked this well. But I am confident in the rationale that I just outlined for you from the neuroscience point of view. And I said to myself when we started doing this, if it doesn't work well, it's because we're not doing it right. Not because it shouldn't work. This is the way the brain develops. This is what we can do. And now it seems we are doing it well enough to produce some pretty dr dramatic results. I'd like to add to that also a couple of points. One is that there's a great deal of research now on the combination of ed tech with excellent teaching. You can't, no one wants in any way to eliminate the teacher or, or thinks that we can surpass what a teacher can do. But what you can do with any kind of ed tech that's well designed is individualize the program and the fast forward program specifically was designed so that every single keystroke that every student makes takes them either up or back in a level of processing that needs to be addressed. So the program adapts to every student. Teacher can't do that with a class of 35 students. They can't adapt to every single student's reading speed to their ability to decode. But teachers have relationships and teachers the human brain has a mirror neuron system that responds to human beings. So I think it's the combination of very well-designed ed tech and excellent teaching that we're all striving for. 
And I must say one more thing, that teachers welcome this program because we use the rotation model where it's small group, whole group, independent practice. So this that's a part of engagement um, because they're engaging in small group, they're engaging in whole group. They also, um, and Dr. Wexler didn't mention, but they have their um, exercises that they do in between where the teacher is constantly engaged in the program. The teacher's analyzing the data. I go to the school and discuss the data with the students, I mean with the teachers. The teachers then have data chats with the students and the parents. So it's constant engagement every way that you look at it. May I? Two part question. Okay. Uh, thank you for, I think so. Thank you for the great research. Thank you for the great stories. Uh, the first part of the question is how much does this cost? And the second part is however much it costs, how do you convince district leaders to buy into this, both financially and cognitively? I guess, um, okay. uh, I would recommend that you talk to Steve Gardner there about costs because it depends on how many students you run, it depends on whether you get a site license, those kinds of issues. Um, but I do think that if you look at the value of the dollar spent that you're getting so much more bang for that buck that actually the money that you are spending for these extra ed tech programs ends up being very worthwhile, especially if in the case of, uh, for example, uh, the school district in Starkville, students are leaving special ed, for example. They are exiting out. If you can get students to exit out of, of interventions, that's saving you a lot of money. So in the end, you are saving a lot of money. It's hard to convince a school district of that sometimes, um, but in the end, that's what will happen. So I agree with the multiplier effect. We're multiplying, so every dollar spent here will get you more out of your other things. Our particular program, I think, is actually cheap. <laughs> and uh, what you get with our program is the computer game exercises, the whole curriculum of physical exercises all mapped out, a whole bunch of teacher resources to know what to do if kids have deficits. But you also get reports on every child similar to a neuropsych assessment that costs usually $4,000. This is where the technology is so important because we can scale. And so you get a neuropsych assessment so you can do individual universal design learning. So you can personalize education and know where a child's strengths and weaknesses are. Costs $4,000. Most kids don't have them in school, and if you do get them in school, you do them once. And then what happens? You make an intervention, the child gets older, you're looking at a report from two years ago to try and plan something. So we give the data I showed you there on those, well, what heretofore had been laboratory research tests, they come out in a report to the teachers. Also, you can go and retest the kids, automatically get tested periodically, but you can go and test them again if you want to for any reason you want, all rolled into the price of about $100 for everything. As a per student for the year. I don't know what, you want to comment? <laughs> Year, they could use it with every child in the school, an elementary school with four or 500 students. That's less than the cost of a paraprofessional. Um, so it can be quite cost effective uh, at scale. I guess part of my question is also not just the cost of purchasing the software, and, but usually school systems have other priorities on the plate. Yeah, can talk and, about, and I can so talk about that it's too. Taking um, teachers offline, it's right. taking time from other things that are the things that tend to speak to those of us at a district level tend to be the dollar signs and, and the results. So what comes to mind immediately for me with the scientific learning piece is there was a study done in Nevada several years ago where the state gave Title I money to schools and districts all over that state and told them they could choose that for two years you can use any program you want we want to look at reading results at the end. And then they got, a, I believe it was a group out of Colorado to independently um, look at the results from the different programs. The program, what speaks to me, is that the program on top, by far, that the growth was made in was with Fast Forward. That's good use of dollars, Title I dollars typically, sometimes special education federal dollars, and it's also the results. But then back to the student. Is it going to make a difference for that kid? So those three things. 
This is what prompted our decision in order for us as a district to actually use the three K-2 schools um, because we wanted the data in order to be able to present the data with our board, with our um, district level leadership, um, superintendent, um, deputy superintendent, so that they were able to buy into the program. But that was our, that was our goal. Well, we had something else happen. We had a private uh, a charter school that wants to get activate because they happen to see our data. I don't know how. And then we ended up with our one of our schools that's for special needs students that basically was kind of upset because we didn't select them as one of the schools and said, we're going to use some of our other grant money in order to purchase the program and has already purchased the program. So it's a it's when they see results and they see the results in the district level data and they're like, what happened to SP Livingston? What happened to Hyde Grove and what happened to Hi um, what happened to John Love? Why are they increasing in their proficiency or in their growth? Because everybody sees the same data. The data speaks. So therefore, that's it right there. That's, that's, what, that's how you get them to buy in. Just, just one note along those lines. We saw that same impact, and they want to see the outcomes. So what we did last year is we decided we would give this program to any teacher in the United States that wants to run it with up to five of their kids for four months. That's enough time to put them through a full sequence. And they can evaluate. There's no cost to that. Um, and so that's a way that we can allow them to try and see the outcomes and use that as a way to break down some of the administrative barriers. That sounds great. I only have four children, so that sounds perfect. <laughs> I, I, we are out of time. Do, do you have a quick one, John? I have a comment. Yeah, for go ahead. Take the mic. I just thought your question was a very legitimate question around the role of teacher. And I've thought a lot about this, about how you integrate technology into great pedagogical excellence. And I think all learning is from feedback. Right, and that can be assimilated by a child and presented with mastery. But I think what we've learned in this conference is certain children have a hard time with the traditional feedback loops of how teaching is done because their brain isn't ready for it. So in a way, we're taking, I don't want to use the word machine learning because that's too impersonal, mm -hmm. but we're taking a game that's very responsive and has the acuity of response to challenge these neural circuits in a way that would be very expensive if a teacher tried to do it. Because you're really, in a way, those sessions are like having a master tutor, yeah. right? Totally but we're automating it and lowering the cost. So I view that what we need to do is, as we learn about the brain and we care about the child, we need to integrate these interventions that makes that child then receptive to the great teacher that is in that classroom, and then we optimize the learning experience. So I've come to terms with this. All right, thank you all. Thank you. Oh, you guys are terrific. Thank you so much.